on this edition of It's a Miracle. When a Category 5 hurricane slammed into southern Florida, Miami residents Jan and Greg Bergera didn't know what to expect. We were afraid that the roof was going to blow off, the shutters were coming off, at any moment the door would blow in, and we actually thought that we would die. But the hurricane was just the beginning of their problems, and a week later, a miracle would save them from an even more certain death. Ugh. Meet one of the few men in the world who've survived an attack by a great white shark and discover the incredible miracle that saved his life. What would you think if you saw something and were then told that it didn't exist? Who was that woman um, that you were sitting with this morning on the dock? I was just totally taken off guard because I didn't know what she's talking about. So I pull over the car and try to get composure because I'd never been in a situation where I've been accused of something I haven't done. I was by myself. I, I wasn't talking with anyone. The hair started standing up on my arms and back of my neck. Was the woman real, a figment of her imagination, or something even more miraculous? The answer tonight on It's a Miracle. Oh, it's a miracle. And now, from PAX TV Studio 611, your host, Richard Thomas. Good evening, and welcome to It's a Miracle. Tonight's show explores the miraculous forces that surround us and protect our lives. They're sometimes called guardian angels, and you're about to discover that they can come in all shapes and sizes, even species. We begin with a situation that even a guardian angel might want to avoid, the 155 mile per hour winds of a tropical hurricane. On August 26, 1992, a Category 5 hurricane slammed into southern Florida, destroying entire communities and causing millions of dollars in damage. But for one family, Hurricane Andrew was also the beginning of a miracle. Jan and Greg Bergera will never forget that night. We were afraid that the roof was going to blow off, the shutters were coming off, at any moment the door would blow in. <laughs> We really didn't know what exactly was hitting the house. It was loud, like explosions, and we actually thought that we would die. Luckily, their house withstood the incredible gale force winds, and by morning, they were able to assess the damage. I was the first one to walk out after everything had subsided, and I couldn't believe what I didn't see. It looked like a bomb had gone off outside. All the debris from trees, every light pole had been snapped, all the telephone lines and power lines were laying in the yard. It left you standing there for a moment and you had to catch your breath. We realized we were not going to have power, water, phones for a very long time and we realized we were on our own. There was no one there to help you. You had to take care of yourself. Jan's father, Dale Collins, drove all the way to Georgia to find a small portable generator. They installed it in the garage where it would be safe from looters. It made life a little more bearable. The generator enabled us to have air conditioning, electricity, a burner on our stove that we could use, a washing machine. It enables to um, have some creature comforts. What the generator couldn't provide was telephone service. That's, that's not gonna work. You never know, miracles do happen. And because phone lines had been blown down all over Miami, it would take weeks before they were fixed. So we realized we were on our own again with no communication with anyone. For Jan Bruguera, this was a major concern. Hi, sweetie. Hi. Doing okay? Yeah. Jan was an insulin-dependent sure. diabetic. You worry too much. And the phone was her lifeline in case of emergency. I felt extremely vulnerable because if you needed help, there was no one to turn to. Oh, it's a hot one, huh? 
A week after the hurricane, life in the disaster zone had settled into a daily routine. My dad and I had made a makeshift clothesline, and as we were out there hanging up our laundry, we noticed there was a man in our backyard, and he was at the telephone pole. Look at that guy over there. What's he doing here? Looks like he's picking some of the telephone lines or something. Did you he seemed to be working on the connections out there, and I thought that was strange because I, there was no phones in the area. There were no power poles in the area. They were all on the ground. I thought, at the time, this was wonderful. This person was fixing our phone. Where do you go? I don't By know. By the time they finished hanging their clothes, the man out back had disappeared. As they re-entered the house, Dale decided to try the kitchen phone. Honey, the phone's working. You're kidding. Better check it out. Wow. Oh my God, it's working. I was thrilled to see we had a phone. I had so many people I wanted to call and just see how they were and talk to people. Word spread quickly, and soon, neighbors were stopping by to use the only working phone in the area. People started coming over, people we didn't know, just to call other people to see, let them know they were OK. OK, guys, it's going to be some air in just a few minutes. That night, Jan Bruguera had a full house. Greg's aunt and uncle, who'd arrived to help with the recovery, shared the master bedroom. Everyone else spread out where they could, hoping to escape from the heat by sleeping as close to the air conditioner as possible. Being able to sleep without an air conditioner would have been impossible from the heat and humidity. So having the air conditioner really helped us sleep peacefully, and it gave us also peace of mind. At about 2 AM, Jan woke up yeah. with a strange feeling. I knew something was wrong, and I automatically assumed it was an insulin reaction because I wasn't able to get up off the floor. I remember laying there just trying to move my arms, trying to move my legs, but nothing was happening. And mentally, I kept telling myself, just get up, get up. When she finally made it to her feet and staggered out to find help, no one responded to her call. The shocking conclusion, when it's a miracle, continues. While recovering from the devastating effects of Hurricane Andrew, the Bruguera family of Miami, Florida received two strokes of good luck. First, they were able to buy a generator that would provide them with much needed power. And second, a repairman chose their home to reconnect downed lines and restore their telephone service. This was especially important since Jan Bruguera was an insulin-dependent diabetic. And then, in the middle of the night, Jan woke disoriented and barely able to move. As she struggled to get help, she suddenly lost consciousness and fell. I remember hearing a loud crashing type noise and I realized that my wife had fallen to the ground. Her father and I picked her up and we took her into the bathroom. She was very pale, almost looked like a ghost. That's how pale she was. Yeah, I think I just had some sugar. And sugar? Like that. Hey, Dad, you got some sugar? sugar? It's in the kitchen. I thought I was having an insulin reaction because I was sweating profusely, and that's one of the symptoms of a low blood sugar. Two minutes later, when Dale had not returned, Greg went out to see what was keeping him. He found Dale passed out on the floor with the candy lying nearby. And I came right back to check on her dad. Out of nowhere, I just passed out. What the heck's going on out there? The sound of Greg's fall woke up his uncle Charlie and his aunt Maggie. And he got up out of bed and walked out to see what had happened. But he never returned. Even as dazed as she was, Jan realized that there was more going on here than an adverse insulin reaction. Aunt Maggie, dial 911. We, we have something wrong here. We need help. There's people collapsing. We can't seem to get moving or, 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 or breathe right. They said it sounds like carbon monoxide poisoning. I was terrified when I saw everything that was happening around me. My husband was passed out in the dining room. Charlie was passed out on the living room floor, and I had no idea where my dad was at that time. The only thing I could think of to do was to go to the glass door and open it.
A short while later, an emergency rescue team arrived on the scene. They found my father and they put him on a stretcher and immediately took him outside. They administered oxygen and immediately took us to a hospital. And we were in there for approximately six hours with oxygen. When Jan and Greg arrived home, they discovered that the source of their debilitating physical problems was located in the garage. We did not run an exhaust outside for the generator in the garage. So the fumes had entered into the house through the attic. And the fumes were poisoning us with the carbon monoxide as we were sleeping. But when they tried to call their relatives with the information, they were in for a surprise. There's nothing. There was absolutely no sound, no. You know, no noise from it whatsoever. That's so weird. There was no dial tone. It was just completely dead, the phone. It was, there was nothing. It wasn't until two months later that their phones were finally working again. Jan was very grateful for that one critical night of phone service. If we didn't have a phone that one night, I truly believe we all would have died. And so she called the phone company to thank the repairman who'd fixed their phone line long enough to save their lives. Hi, I'm trying to locate a telephone repairman that was at my house August 31st repairing our phone. Really? The operator told me that there was no way anyone could have ever restored our phone service. Huh. Are you you're sure? The damage in the area that we lived in was so extensive, that's why it took so many months just to restore the phone service. Hey, look at that guy over there. What's he doing here? Who was the man who Jan and her father saw working on the telephone lines in her yard that day? I have no idea who this person was. The only thing I can think of is that he was an angel. Boy, there's an optimist if I ever saw him. There was no phones. This man suddenly appears, and we have phones. I believe what happened was a miracle. Now, Maggie, dial 911. We have something wrong here. I thought about it, and I realized that and we had a guardian angel looking over us, and that's why we had a phone just for that one night. They said it sounds like carbon monoxide poisoning. <gasps> I get peace of mind knowing that I'm never alone and that I always have an angel with me. And I truly believe in angels now. It's been eight years since Hurricane Andrew, and the Bregueras continue to live in Miami, Florida. And every hurricane season, they wonder if they'll be requiring a little extra help to get by. But so far, their guardian angel hasn't been needed. We'll be right back. Coming up on It's a Miracle. While testing a new invention in the waters off Point Lobos, California, three divers become separated from one another. I felt as I was descending, I had company. There was something else in the water there with me. I can't see anything, and I felt that the hair on the back of my neck was standing up. In the next instant, one of them would come face to face with the most terrifying denizen of the deep, a great white shark. That's next on It's a Miracle. As human beings, we sometimes forget that in the food chain, we're not the last link. There are other living creatures, bigger and stronger, who would just as soon have us for lunch as wait around for something tastier. One of these creatures is the great white shark, and to escape its powerful jaws can take a miracle. Just south of California's famous Monterey Peninsula is one of America's most unusual state parks, Point Lobos. What makes this state park so unique is that most of it lies underwater. Its coves are a diver's paradise, filled with some of Mother Nature's most spectacular creations, as well as some of her most deadly. On June 30th, 1995, veteran divers Stephen Larson and his girlfriend Marcy Leconte chose Point Lobos Blue Cove to help test their friend Marco Flagg's new invention, a dive tracker. This small device contains a sonar computer that could help divers find their way in dark and murky waters in much the same way as the instruments that help airline pilots locate their bearings during a storm. 
But today, the waters were far from dark and murky. We had probably 60 or so feet of visibility. And it was real uh, good light. It was, it was a real pleasurable dive. After an hour underwater, the divers decided to take a break, leaving their anchor line in place and heading for shore. They would return later for a second dive. For our second dive, the cloud cover had rolled in. The sun had gone down. Because it was late in the day, we were considering not doing the second dive of the day and, and instead going home. But they ignored their misgivings and headed back into open waters. We pulled the boat up to the buoy, which was the location of our first dive, and we clipped the boat off to that buoy. We all three pretty much hit the water at the same time. And they immediately could see that the conditions had changed. Their visibility was less than 10 feet. The team got separated as soon as we got in the water. The current pulled Steve in one direction, while the motorized scooter Marco was riding took him in another and Marcy went down the anchor line. The three of us went three different directions. Moments later, they would each experience the same terrifying feeling. I felt as I was descending, I had company. There was something else in the water there with me. I can't see anything, and I felt that the hair on the back of my neck was standing up. But it was Marco who would come face to face with the terror they were feeling. At a depth of 50 feet, he suddenly saw a giant tail fin sweep by. It was a great white shark, and as he struggled to get back to the surface, it closed in for the kill. Marco was helpless as the shark's powerful jaw took his torso in its grip. And then, just as suddenly as he was struck, the shark released him and swam away. Was it preparing for a second strike? Was there blood in the water that would attract more predators? Marco wasted no time returning to the surface and throwing himself into the boat. Marco was safe for the moment, but his friends were still in danger. He used the engine to warn them. All of a sudden, I hear the motor of the boat. At that, I, I knew that I had to immediately return to the boat. But Steve's movements were actually putting him in greater danger. The attack profile of a shark is almost always to approach the unwary swimmer from below. Once safely inside the boat, Steve learned that Marco had been attacked by a great white. And there's my girlfriend on the bottom of the ocean, and it doesn't appear that she's coming up. Percy! I was frantic, trying to gun the motor and get her to come up, and gun the motor. But Marcy was nowhere in sight. And what do you do? Do you get back in the water and try to rescue her? That's crazy. Finally, she surfaced. When I broke the surface, I asked Stephen what was going on, and he said, Marco's been bitten by a great white. I flew into the boat, surprisingly enough, uh, with my dive gear on. Now, with all three divers in the boat, Steve raced for shore. When I looked at Marco in the boat, his wetsuit appeared that it was completely intact, and it was hard to believe that he had been bitten by a great white. Park ranger Jerry Loomis was equally shocked by what he found. When I saw him, I thought to myself, this doesn't look like a shark bite victim, but I said, I heard that there was a shark bite. Can you tell me anything about it? And Marco said to me, I'm the victim. But how had he escaped massive injury? The mystery wouldn't be solved until Marco could be fully examined. First, Dr. Blin Schiedler confirmed that the attack had indeed been made by a great white shark. What clued me in was the fact that he had a 
bite on, on the one side of his arm across the middle of his abdomen and on his leg. There's no other fish with an 18 inch width that uh, has a mouth that big in this area. This still left the question, what could have possibly stopped this powerful beast from tearing Marco in two? The answer was nothing less than a miracle. Well, Marco had a computer on that covered his chest, and it had a tank on that protected his back. When the shark bit him, it bit metal, both top and bottom. Had it, there been no metal there, he'd be dead. The prototype for the dive tracker unit had three nice, neat teeth marks in the keypad on this tracking device. It's a once in a lifetime occasion to be in the water with a great white shark and survive or live to tell about it. Um, it's like being shot at and missed. Marco Flagg had been miraculously saved by his own invention, and he fully intends to keep on diving. His brush with death has only strengthened his desire to live his life to the full. When the day comes that I jump into that old pine box, I want to be able to look back and say, by God, I've had a great life, and not just a careful life. If it was me, and by some miracle I'd live through a shark attack, I think I'd opt for the careful life. How much more excitement do you need to have a great life? We'll be right back with more miracles right after this. Coming up on It's a Miracle, when a young couple learns that they've been approved to adopt a baby girl from Korea, it's like a dream come true. But were they the victims of some cruel joke? When we didn't hear anything, we decided to call the agency, and they told us that these things take time and not to worry about it. So we waited another couple of weeks and became even more anxious because we knew that something was wrong. What had happened to the child they hoped to adopt? Find out when It's a Miracle returns. And now, once again, Richard Thomas. In our next story, a young couple attempting to adopt a child from a foreign country become entangled in bureaucratic red tape. And just when they think they'll never break through, they get a little help from an angel or two. In 1983, Don and Carol Kolanda adopted their first child Paul from South Korea. We decided to adopt because Don and I couldn't have children of our own. We didn't care where the child came from, what country or nationality. We just knew that we wanted to be a family and adopt. We went ahead and applied and uh, within three months our son Paul arrived and we were real happy and began to grow as parents do. Paul's adoption went so smoothly that when he was three, the Colindas decided to adopt a second Korean child. Hello? We went through a different adoption agency. They hadn't done very many foreign adoptions, so we were kind of like the pioneers for them. And since we had already been through it before, we knew what to expect. That's wonderful. The new agency quickly approved them and assigned them a two-month-old child. Don, that was the agency. They've assigned a, a little girl. <laughs> a few days later, they received a package of immigration forms along with a photo. Oh, look at that. As soon as we saw the picture, it was like an instant love. She's adorable. We just thought, oh, there she is. That's what she looks like. And you start thinking, well, gosh, I just can't wait till she gets here. Uh, let's see, we gotta fill out some papers. They completed the necessary paperwork and based on their previous experience, expected to be contacted within two weeks. But the call never came. When we didn't hear anything, we decided to call the agency. Yes, hi, this is Don Colanda. I'm calling about the adoption papers that my wife and I filled out a little while ago. I was just wondering if there was any kind of an update or uh, any more information that you might have for us. And they told us that it was fine, these things take time and not to worry about it. So we waited another couple of weeks and became even more anxious because we knew that something was wrong. But each time they spoke with the agency, they were given the same runaround. 
No, sir, everything is really under control. If they were you, like, um, just relax, just everything's going to be fine. There's call. nothing you need to do. And don't call us, we'll call you. Okay, thank you for calling. And so that's when we became very frustrated and uh, decided that we couldn't stand it anymore waiting in Oklahoma City. And so we decided to go to a little pond with cabins and see if we could find an answer. But after a day in the country, no answer had been received. And so they decided to return home the next day. Right. How about tomorrow morning? Yeah, let's do it. But when Carol awoke the next morning, to her surprise, Don was nowhere to be found. I looked around, Don wasn't there in the room. Don? Don. So I got up and went over to the window and pulled back the drape and looked out. And I could see Don sitting there with his legs hanging over the dock and he was talking with someone. So I didn't think anything of it. I thought, well, I'm still kind of tired. I'll lay back down. So I tossed and turned a bit, and I waited about 15 minutes, and he didn't come back. Carol got dressed and went to the window again to see what was delaying her husband. When I looked this time, they were very close together, and they looked like they were in a very deep, engrossing conversation. I thought that was a little strange, seeing as Don didn't know this woman, and I didn't know this woman. Carol was beginning to get annoyed. Paul. She woke okay. up Paul and started getting ready Let's to go. leave. We're going. Hurry up. So I got stuff in the suitcase, and about 15 minutes later, I decided he's not back yet. Where is he? So I looked out again, and I thought, surely he's not still out there talking to the same woman. And here he was, he had moved to a bench, and this time he had his back to this little lady. And it looked like she was whispering something into his ear. And I thought, well, that's really strange of Don. First, he's too intimate with this woman, and now he's over there and he's being totally rude to her. That's so unlike him. What's wrong with him? Getting even angrier, Carol packed up the last of their belongings and got Paul ready to go. So I went to the door, and there was Don standing there by himself. Are you all packed? Yeah. And he said, oh, you got everything all packed and ready? I said, yeah, I got it all packed and ready. Let's just put Paul in the car and let's go. I think it was a good trip, honey. I feel really good about it. Good. So we're driving down the road, and Carol's being really quiet, and that's unusual. What's wrong? I, I don't know. I tried to, a couple times to try to get her to talk and she was just real short. Well, something's eating you. Yeah, something is. Well, what is it? Who was that woman um, that you were sitting with this morning on the dock? What? I was just totally taken off guard because I didn't know what she was talking about. And I said, I saw the lady, Don, that you were talking to. It's just a little short, gray-haired camper type lady. I know what I saw. I looked out three different times. So I pull over the car and try to get composure because I'd never been in a situation where I've been accused of something I haven't done. I was by myself. I, I wasn't talking with anyone. The hair started standing up on my arms and back of my neck. And I was talking to myself, and I was praying. You were praying, and there was no one there. I could feel the goosebumps on my arms. I could just feel like something out of the ordinary happened. Then who did I see? <laughs> and I said, well, Carol, I don't know what you saw, but I know what I have to do. I know what we need to do. I feel like I know what to do now. Don had received the answer he'd been looking for. But who was the mysterious woman that Carol saw at the lake? The answer, when it's a miracle continues.
When Don and Carol Colander tried to adopt a baby girl from Korea, they became frustrated with delays by their adoption agency, and so they retreated to a lakeside cabin to try to come up with a solution to their problem. While there, Carol saw her husband speaking to a strange woman by the lake, but when asked who the woman was, Don said he'd been alone, praying about what they should do next, and he had received an answer. I feel like we should call the International Adoption Agency. That's going over their heads. I know it is. That was a risky thing to do. Soon you're adopting, it's just not the thing to do to not use your local adoption agency for all your correspondence. And I thought maybe it could make them mad. And they have every right to pull the adoption right out from underneath us. But we discussed it on the way home, and I could see how joyful and peaceful he was. And I knew that something miraculous had happened. Monday morning came. And we called the agency in Oregon. Hello? Yes, hello. Uh, my, my name is Don Colinda. I'm calling about an international adoption. Uh, let me transfer you to the right person. Okay, thanks. And they patched me through, and the lady said, Hi, my name's Judy. Uh, hi, Judy. My name is Don Colinda. I'm calling about an international adoption. And I said, job. We're anxiously awaiting news of when our daughter's coming. And she said, I'll call the agency in Korea, and I'll get back with you right away. OK. Thank you, Judy. She said she was going to call Korea and call us back. A half hour later, she called back and said there had been a glitch that it was in Korea, and they did find our paperwork, and it had been misplaced. And everything's in order, and you're going to get your baby on Saturday. <sighs> oh, that's terrific. Thank you so much for your help. All right, I'll talk to you soon. There was a paper in the wrong place. They fixed it, and she said she should be here by Saturday. Saturday? Yeah. <laughs> so I was so excited that just the four days before, we knew nothing, and now she was going to be in our arms. It was quite a miracle. It's hard to wait, isn't it? Yes, it's hard to wait. On Saturday, Don and Carol flew to Los Angeles, where they videotaped the arrival of the newest member of their family, Jackie Colinda. It was really nice to be able to film that and see a plane rolling coming in. It's like, you know, giving birth, sort of. When she put her in my arms, it was just like home. Everybody in the airport disappeared at that moment besides Jackie. It was wonderful. I knew everything was going to be all right then. It was just wonderful just to see how happy my wife was and to see that our daughter was in our arms and to see that a picture was actually a person. And then to see her smiling at me was just, oh, a father's joy. I think she loves you, Paul. When Don and Carol finally arrived home with the baby, there was one more thing they felt they needed to do. Personally thank Judy for all her help. And we are gonna phone some flowers to Judy because she was she was an answer to prayer. Hello, adoption agency. Yes, hi, uh, Can I speak to Judy, please? And they said, Judy who? And I said, I don't know. That's all I know is Judy. And they said, well, sir, there's never been a Judy at this office. Uh, well, are, are you sure? I just spoke to her last week. She helped us with our adoption. She called Korea for us. Sir, there's no Judy here. And they said, there's never been a Judy at this office. And even if there was a Judy, she couldn't give you information over the phone. Yeah, OK, thanks. And so I hung up the phone, and I told Carol. Carol, they say there's no one there named Judy. Well, there has to be. Who called Korea then? I don't know. We decided that the woman on the dock must have been an angel, and the lady that we spoke to in Oregon must have been an angel. Were they the same angel or two different angels? Carol Colinda has her own theory. I think that this happened out of prayer. We were at a point that we could not fix this problem. God was aware of the problem, and I think he answered our prayer in the form of an angel telling Don what to do. Then when we did call the agency, I think that she was able to find out what the problem was and get it solved. But the biggest miracle of all is just having Jackie for our daughter.
that's the biggest miracle. We'll be right back. Next, the story of a dog that wouldn't stop barking. No matter what I did, Gus would be there, standing guard, yes. doing his job to bark at me like he'd never seen me before. Yes, hi hey boy. And then one oh, day, he going? stopped barking long enough to deliver a message that one young couple will never forget. When It's a Miracle returns. What's the difference between a guard dog and a guardian angel? No, it's not a joke. It's a question that Tom Holloway and Judy Averro have been asking themselves for years. You see, Judy and Tom had a very strange encounter that left them wondering about many things, including the fine line that separates life and death. In 1977, Judy Aviro needed some routine dental work, and so she made an appointment with Dr. Tom Holloway. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Great, how are you doing? I needed a new dentist, and I'd heard about Tom from my mom, and she said he was very good looking, and um, I was attracted to him right from the start. The feeling was mutual. Judy and Tom began dating, and it wasn't long before she moved into his house in a suburb of Sacramento, California. That's where she met the neighbor's black lab, Gus. I really don't think your neighbor's dog likes me. Oh, uh, it's just Gus. He's always barking like that. So and Gus continued to bark at them at every available opportunity, always protecting his small patch of yard. No matter what I did, whether it was even just take out the garbage or go out to pull a weed. Gus would be there, standing guard, Gus. doing his job to bark at me like he'd never seen me before. Every time we would come out into the backyard, Gus would be there barking at us. And it became a joke between us. You know, you figure out sometime, you know, maybe he'd learn who we are, you know? But before Gus could learn who Judy was, she and Tom ended their relationship and she moved to Hawaii. Still, they remained close friends. I had been gone for about a year. I was coming back for a vacation. I called Tom. He picked me up and we came over to his house. I'd been out of the scene and we hadn't spoken about Gus or I hadn't even thought about Gus for a year. Wow, this is Gus. Hi, boy. Gus wasn't boy. barking and that was very unusual. <laughs> hey, doggy. Good boy. Hey. And I was saying, oh, good dog, Gus. Good dog, you know. Finally, you're remembering who we are and letting us be in peace. And then we went back inside. We didn't think anything odd about it. It wasn't until a few days after Judy returned to Hawaii that Tom learned how truly odd their experience had been. Phil. Hey, Tom. I ran into doing? my neighbor well. that weekend. He was working in his yard, so he came up and we, just, we talked at the edge of the driveway. And I complimented him on how his dog had learned to recognize me and had stopped barking at me. Um, when, when was this, Tom? Uh, Thursday. And he just shook his head and he said, that's impossible. Hey, uh, Tom, I, I, that couldn't have been Gus. Um, we had him put to sleep on Monday. Wow. And they discovered he had parvo. So they, they said the most humane thing for him was just go ahead and put him to sleep. So the doc had been dead three days before Judy and I saw this dog on, on Thursday. Tom's first thought was to call Judy. It was such an unusual thing that had happened. Hello? And I had to let her know that Hi. we had just seen a dog who had died the weekend before we saw this. I was just speaking with Phil outside, and uh, he had to take his dog and put him down. So the other day, what we saw was, I guess, kind of a ghost. Wow, that just gives me chills just to think about it. Judy was astonished, uh, uh, but they were both we certain of what they'd seen. So it couldn't have been another dog because the neighbor's yard was completely fenced in. Besides, they recognized Gus. There's no question that this particular dog was the dog that I had been used to seeing. There was only one Gus, only one black Labrador in that, in that yard. Tom wouldn't see Gus again until a year later.
the day after his neighbor moved away. Gus? I had a feeling that he was somewhat bewildered, so I spoke to Gus. They don't live here anymore. Go find them. And you, certainly you feel somewhat foolish about talking to a dog, especially a deceased dog. Go home. Go find them. But Gus seemed to understand what I said, and he turned and he walked about 10 feet and just sort of dissolved into the air. I never saw Gus after that day. That was the last time after the neighbors had moved. Tom and Judy have often thought back on that day. They saw Gus sitting quietly by the fence. It's a memory that will stay with them forever. Not so much for how strange it was, but for what it means. The miracle for me would be having a hint that what we live is not all there is. There's something beyond, and nothing is as final as it can be. I think that Gus stayed in his position as guardian of the house because he had a bond with that family, and that was his obligation, his responsibility. They don't live here anymore. The miracle was, to me, that life exists after what we call death. And maybe love is a power that can bridge that gap between life and death. When we return, there have been some new developments in two of our guardian angel stories from previous shows, and I think you'll be very interested in what's happened. Don't go away. Welcome back. Last year, we presented the story of a young man who was headed for a life of crime and might have ended up behind bars for life if his gun hadn't jammed during a robbery. Instead, he was sent to Camp Fred Miller, a minimum security facility for juvenile offenders, and it was there that he met a very unlikely guardian angel who helped turn his life around, even getting him a job in a print shop. Oh, well, now I'm truly happy. Every part of my life is fulfilled now. Well, we just learned that the vice president of that company was watching TV the night Jose Moya's story aired, and he was so impressed by what he saw that he immediately gave Jose a promotion and a raise. Who says that miracles don't happen? And remember the story of Spammy the pig who saved his best friend Spot the calf from a blazing inferno? Dear Spammy, you're my hero. Well, according to Spammy's owners, the response has been phenomenal. Our viewers have become guardian angels themselves, sending hundreds of letters, gifts, and donations. Spammy's gained 70 pounds, and she's now a free-range pig with the complete run of the Morgan's 40-acre farm. She continues to spend all her free time with Spot. Well, that's our show for this evening. I want to thank you for joining us, and a special thanks to all the people who shared their remarkable stories tonight on It's a Miracle. It's our hope that whenever you need one, you'll find a miracle in your life, too. Until next time, I'm Richard Thomas. Good night.